podcasts on unctv.org are made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNCTV. For many North Carolinians, uh, Lee Smith is our favorite author. So the good news is that Lee Smith has a new book, and the better news is that she's here to talk to us about Mrs. Darcy and the Blue-Eyed Stranger on North Carolina Book Watch, next. Funding for North Carolina Book Watch is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNCTV, and by the Mary Duke Biddle Foundation, Quail Ridge Books and Music, and the North Carolina Humanities Council. Welcome to North Carolina Book Watch. I'm D.G. Martin, and my guest is Lee Smith, who is the author of a new book, Mrs. Darcy and the Blue-Eyed Stranger, New and Selected Stories. Lee Smith, welcome. Well, thank you, D.G. I'm glad to be here. Well, Lee, I, I, I worried about how to introduce you because uh, everybody in North Carolina <laughs> knows who you are, at least everybody <laughs> likes to read books. But I, so I wondered, um, you've been introduced a, a thousand, ten thousand times. Oh, Do you, is there, have you ever, did you ever have a memorable introduction, one that uh, <laughs> sticks in your mind? <laughs> well, I was once on a uh, talk show when the host uh, said, well, I hadn't read your book, but I hear it's real good. <laughs> <laughs> at least he was at He least said, he tell was us honest. about it. And I was on the spot, which I was not prepared for. It was really hilarious. Well, it's, it's, it's interesting. It seems like yesterday that we were together on uh, North Carolina Book Watch talking about your latest novel on Agate Hill. It, which does, was, it does seem like yesterday. You know, yeah. a, a, a long narrative. I mean, an epic. Yes. Well, how would you, would you say an epic narrative? I mean, just wonderful in the sense that it carried you for a long time. And now you bring us a short book of short stories. That's 14, right. 14 stories. That's right. That's right. But you know, DG, anytime I'm writing a long book, such as on Agate Hill, or one that I happen to be working on right now, I'm also taking breaks to write short stories because in the middle of working on a book that's going to take you, you know, four or five years, things will happen to me in my own real life that will just be like a shot, you know, and just make such an impression and I just have to stop and write a story. So most of the stories come from a different impulse for me than the novels. The immediate stories and are, something in present. They're in the immediate present. and they're personal. Whether it's something that happens to me that I can just see going into a story or a glimpse of some memorable person that I know I will never see again and I just can't stand it. So <laughs> I have to give her a story too and find out how things went for her, you know, that kind of thing. So it's a different impulse and both things are always going long at the same time. Well, you tell me once that you don't keep a journal exactly like many I do don't, and that, no. that sometimes the short stories are your substitute for a record of your ongoing yeah, life. I, I keep something. I, I wouldn't say it's a journal and I wouldn't say it's a diary and I know I'll never write a memoir but what I do keep is just sort of a list of things that make an impression on me. Uh, like I've got a little notebook in my pocketbook. I've always got a little notebook and it might just be somebody I, somebody I glimpse looking over at a stoplight, or it might be a line that I overhear in Harris Teeter, and it'll be just something. It's kind of, I think if you are a writer, you tend to sort of know when you hear a line or, or see an image that is going to activate your imagination. But um, you need to write it down because that's going to happen in a long, busy day. You know, and so you need to. Find well, you brought it. a little notebook. That's the kind of notebook I. You brought a little notebook with you. Is that is I've that your notebook? That you, a, a different yeah. notebook, or yeah, you got yeah, a regular? I got a million one. notebooks, but it's right. Uh, Flannery O'Connor had a wonderful um, line about this, about just kind of about being a writer, and she said, you know, it's a habit of being, and it really is. It's a way of noticing the world, and it's a great 
pleasure. I think I, a lot of students, um, I always ask my students to keep such a notebook just while they're in a class, and a number of them tell me that it just makes them really notice the world more. I mean, it makes you appreciate your own daily life. It's like you're tuned in because, you know, we go around with all our worries and to-do lists and so on in our heads every day, and suddenly if we are if we have to write in that little book and we have to notice the world because we've signed up for a class, the world is there. And it's just full well, let's, Let me give you a test. <laughs> let me give you a test yeah, now and just yeah. see how this works out. Uh, the, the title story in this book, Mrs. Darcy and the Blue-Eyed Stranger. So if you can, think, I want you to talk about this story and do it in the context of the little scribble that you made in a notebook one time that led to the story and how the story okay. might be different from your the, from okay. what you really observe. Absolutely. Well, I always have a little notebook, and particularly when I travel, I'm not taking pictures. I'm writing in my little notebook, and the scenes that, that I see are not, you know, snapped as, as visual images. They're, you know, they're little, they're little verbal snapshots. And we were at Pawleys Island. We happened to have rented a house next to a house that um, was occupied by a recent widow, an older lady, who had begun, according to her daughters, to behave strangely since the husband's death. I mean, she was no longer the conservative, prim and proper mama that they expected as she approached her 80s. You know, she was in her late 70s. Instead, she had begun, you know, eating nothing but frozen pizza and making wild new friends and actually uh, turned to charismatic. In her, in her religion, in, in her, her religion, religion she'd always been a Presbyterian. <laughs> 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 the frozen chosen. No, I'm, now just, I'm just, just you're I'm getting just personal. Kidding. I'm you're just getting kidding. personal now. I'm just kidding. But anyway, uh, this really was a situation, and the daughters would be gathering on the deck, the three of them and their husbands, or you know whatever, and just talking about it, and sort of talking with each other about what to do about Mama, which is a conversation that. We all have, you know, I'm sure my children well, are already gathering and yeah, thinking what to do about me. Rings true. What did you, now, yeah. and excuse so, me for interrupting, what, did, yeah. you and when did, did you write, write down? I just wrote down the situation. Like, like in, a, in a sentence, in a paragraph? Yeah, I just wrote down uh, her, no, a description of the widow standing in a caftan, sort of looking out to sea, and the daughters sort of huddling together, you know, as if she were somehow now other, oh, gosh, yeah. you know, it was like a painting. I, I see it almost like an impressionistic painting, mm -hmm. you know, maybe of uh, a beachscape, you know, a, a Monet or something like that, or, you know, they're all out on the beach and the wind is blowing and she is into something different and they are threatened by it. And it just, that's the image, it was that image and the, you know, and the children playing and the wind whipping up the waves and she is looking at something that they can't quite see. And so that was it. That, and I just, from there, I thought, well, what? I didn't really know what the problems were. I didn't really know what the family was like. But I just took it off from there and, um, you know. And years later, a month later, a week later, or right there at the beach, you start probably, typing on it? Uh, well, you know, then other things. No, I didn't. It was probably two years later that I actually wrote the story. But in the meantime, I was having some experiences with my own aging parents and different things and uh, you know everything feeds in and suddenly you've got it suddenly that image makes sense in terms of a potential All right now the story. fair thing to do would be so. to say okay now uh, those folks who are listening to our conversation go buy the book and read the story but no you got to tell us a little bit <laughs> about who Mrs. Darcy was. Well, Not the whole the story, story, but just tell us a little bit about the story yeah. and, and the, how it developed out of this impression and real well, life experience. Well, of course I began, I mean, I had this image and then I began to wonder, okay, what did she see? What was she looking for? What did she see? And immediately I decided that she was having religious visions of some sort or another. And she was seeing something and She was there. seeing something. Right, this is your imagination. Yeah, but also it was a stormy week actually when we had been down at the beach and there had been frequent thunderstorms which are not typical of August and um, there had been rainbows over the beach and somehow, and we saw a double rainbow at one point which was surprising and that, that found its way into my notes too. It had and so I began to think well the double rainbow meant something and she's having a vision and then I decided that she was seeing a stranger. She was actually seeing 
Jesus or maybe Willie Nelson. Or, or, an, or an angel. Or, or, yeah. who, or an or angel or whatever, but somebody in a long sort of row. And that this would, sort of this would further disturb her, her yes. uh, children. Yes, and she absolutely was, though. I mean, and this is real, and that just really interested me. Okay, how does that affect the children? Because I had already begun to realize we're the sandwich generation, you know, we're trying to take care of mama, but then our own grown children, you know, are, are thinking about us. And so it's just really interesting to be there. And I, I was thinking about how grown children do not like for their older parents to change and how did that affect them. And so this conflict was set up. And, of course, I've always been interested in charismatic beliefs of all kinds. And... Um, so suddenly I had a story. All right, well, what was the story? Uh, well, let me, let the yes, let story me, is that she looks out. She, they're all there together for a for beach vacation. She looks out, has a vision, falls down in a dead faint. And then when she comes to, she tells them all that she's seen a man in a long, you know, with long hair and a sort of a captain himself coming toward her. And she's ready. You know, she said, I went to him, of course. I mean, there's this. You know, this sense, and they are just astonished, and they're all deciding what to do about her. And uh, only one daughter is sympathetic. Only what, one. What, what, in your mind, turns this from a series of events and memories and then um, imaginary um, supplements to the memories? What, what has to happen to make it a story? You just have to start writing it. <laughs> No, 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 no. What, no, I'm what, quite what? serious. I'm quite serious because this is just, a, you know, it's, it's a sea of impressions, literally, and ideas. But once you actually think it through and think, okay, whose story is it? It's Mrs. Darcy's story. But it's going to be, in this instance, omniscient. you got to think two things. Whose story is it, number one? And what's going to be the technical point of view in the story? Is it going to be told through her eyes, Mrs. Darcy, or through one of the daughters? And in this case, I chose to tell the sort of ancient 19th century omniscient point of view, you know, a little bit from everyone, which is kind of the hardest way for me to write. But it just seemed to be a group image because of that initial well, visual image. And so it is it's a little bit from everybody. It's just, okay, what does this mean for everyone? But it ends finally with being Mrs. Darcy's story and her triumph. She sends them all back to Charlotte. <laughs> so that's the, 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 <laughs> and she's there. She is on the beach waiting. The, the story uh, ending is not the right word, but the the con concluding moment or the yeah. how, the moment that we're looking for that makes it a story is when she triumphs by sending her children right. back and taking charge of her life. And even taking though she, charge of her life, even though they don't approve, and even though. She herself even knows that it's just so unusual, you know, you know, but it's her life. And damn it, she's going to take, <laughs> you know, she's going to take charge of it. And so that's the moment. That's the moment we're going for. And she's alone on the deck chair looking out, and she's ready. She's waiting well, well, for whatever. And she's still open to life at her age. This, of course, uh, Ms., uh, Mrs. Darcy is not only the hero of this story but is also this is the title uh, of the book of the whole book yeah but just one story and this story as you pointed out is told from a, w w a third person on yes, this point right. of view yes. uh, several of your stories uh, in, and maybe um, are charmingly written in the first person in which you just seem to get inside the character well, and tell it from that point of yeah. view so get, what is your favorite First person story. Or what is it? Oh my goodness! I no, don't well, know. just pick one to illustrate well, uh, how you came to use there, that voice. Yeah, well, there is one in here um, named. Oh, what is the name? Chanel. I changed the name. <laughs> oh yeah, the, is this the Southern Cross or the this? Southern, Southern Cross? Cross yeah. Yes, and which had another name for a while. But again, this is an instance of it was inspired by running into a girl who made such an impression on me and then I just worried about how things are going to turn out for her and so I had to write her story. Can I tell, tell it really Well, quick? I wish you would and I'll, let, me, but let me tell you how I reacted yeah, to this yeah. story because this is a story of a, it's a, a strong floozy, first person it, voice. strong first person voice with the woman whom we would look down on as being opportunistic and a little bit sleazy who, but who has latched on to a rich man who's married and she's 
on a yacht with him in a Caribbean port. Right. And, and uh, she's telling us how she used all her tricks of the trade <laughs> to get there. But, and then about the moment that we kind of say, I don't want anything to do with this woman, she burst out in, yeah. in a sympathetic way. Now, I hadn't told that story, but I'll tell you how I reacted to it. Yeah. How did you get, how did you get to, into this story? Well, actually, I was on assignment for American Airlines magazine in the Caribbean on an island named Myro <laughs> with my uh, husband. And we were, it was a very small island on a half moon bay, and we were staying sort of back in the jungle here at a guest house, and then we walked up to the water to a restaurant, which was just a house where they were cooking one thing, and chickens are running around, and Christmas tree lights are strung through the pines and everything, and the palm trees. And I was fascinated by all the people there because they were coming in from their yachts on dinghies. Uh. And they were a sort of person that I had only ever seen in magazines. <laughs> You know, and I was just, I mean, this is a novelist paradise, Judy, so I was just so taken with them, and I was dying to overhear every table, and many, you know, many other languages actually were going on at the tables, but anyway, I was dying to listen to everyone, which I couldn't quite do, and one table near us fascinated me most of all, because it was these three kind of guys that were sort of, had sculpture cut hair, and they were sort of buff, and they were sort of had gold chains, you know, and I'm thinking, oh, but the woman with them, the young girl, was so beautiful. And uh, I just thought, oh, she must be, I just couldn't imagine. You know, she, and why was she with those sleazy people? So the minute she got up to go to the restroom, I went too. And then she was um, smoking a sort of a long European cigarette. And I had conceived the idea she was French. So I said to her, how are you? <laughs> you know, like you do when you can't speak the language. I said, where are you from? <laughs> And she said, Hazard, Kentucky. <laughs> <laughs> and I couldn't believe it because it's right over the mountains from where I was from. And so I just chatted with her, didn't really learn at all what in the world she was doing on a yacht with these three dubious looking guys. But I had to make up her story because I couldn't oh, well. stand to see the end of her. And of course, I found her to be a very sympathetic character, finally. Well, I. Um Gosh, time's moving along so fast. And one of the, uh, this is not the right time to ask this yes, question, yes, but yes, I've got to whatever. ask it, or, or maybe it is the right time, because uh, to a certain degree, you've either confessed or asserted that your stories are often autobiographical. And so I, is, is the story in any respect uh, the little mountain girl who's lifted herself up through? Well, uh, it is, of course. Yeah, it's the little mountain girl who's finding a way, who's found a way out, and now she's uh, now she's trying to establish her own value system, sort of. I uh, mean, that's that's you know that's what's going on. So you there. had an identity. I mean, not the same yeah, kind of identity. No, but I that do. You I do, and that's that really really interests me, and that is that kind of that is at play in a number of these stories, who are women, often often trying to often sort of changing class. Yes. You know, I, yeah, I write yeah, yeah, about, yeah, yeah, right. I write about class yeah, that, that, and it interests me. And, and you move from and one to I another. And I write a lot about women and women's issues and women's identity and how they can, you know, how we can find ourselves and be ourselves within roles that are so often assigned. Well, what you, you know? what and we so, find looking back is yeah. that uh, a lot of the very, very best people that we know have, um, I don't want to say modest roots, but they have they've gr grown up in independent, poor circumstances, and they've yeah. learned how that they have to make their own way. And by learning how they've made their own way, they're better than some of us who kind of were pushed yeah. along the way. Absolutely, and I'm interested. That's what I'm interested in, DG, is in all these stories. What we were talking a little bit earlier about what makes a story, yeah. and what makes a story is a person who is on the verge of change. And I like to write a story that catches those turning points in people's lives. So if you, we all have them. We all have them. The moment that kind of captures and epitomizes that where we went this way or we went that way. So and reading that just the story is really fun for me to think about what it is. You look know? for the turning point. Yeah, I mean, that's the. Right. Uh, that's, that's, that's the. That's right. And my, uh, and my characters, I mean, my characters are braver than I. They're often 
you know, acting out things that I never experienced and wouldn't have ever done, but the issue may be the same, you well, know, as they try particularly to, to define them themselves and be true to themselves and figure out what that means. <laughs> well, this is, uh, this is a question I wanted to ask you, and yeah. it's, uh, in, in some sense, every one of these characters um, in the 14 stories in Mrs. Darcy, you could say are weird. And, and so, uh, <laughs> or at least, I mean, that you could argue, argue. And on the other hand, you could argue that every one of these people is just an ordinary person and that yes. all of us have a weird, well, what is your perspective? Do you look at all of us, the rest of us as ordinary people and we got a weird streak that you're looking well, for? Well, I wouldn't or, say weird. I wouldn't what? say weird. I would say um, that each one of us is like a locked treasure chest or something. I mean, that each one of us, so many of us, you know, we might seem the same on the surface, but we each have an individual past and we each have our own fears and beliefs and dreams and aspirations and secrets. And that's what fiction's about. It's about the inner life. It's not, it's about the weird stuff. The stuff that is not weird really, but different from everyone else. That's what makes, makes it interesting because if we only dealt with what we expect, then that's stereotype. So fiction's got to go, if it's going to be good, I think, if it's going to be really interesting, it's got to go way down. And I like to actually use some characters that would seem to be stereotypes, like the red hat ladies, or Chanel, the girl on the make, on the yacht, on the yacht. or the very acerbic, White wine, liberal, academic wife in house to. I like to take some people who. All right, would well, look, I got to interrupt go you because go we down. just got a minute, and oh, you no. and, and, and you've uh, brought out the characters of one of my yeah. favorite stories in House Tour, oh, and the Red Hat you. Ladies, and so uh, can you very quickly tell us where this story came from, and then tell us Again, sort of what's it happening. It came from uh, actual experience. I live in a very old house. It's never on the house tour because we're such horrible housekeepers. <laughs> My husband and I both write at home. But I was upstairs writing one day and I heard this little, 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 little sound down in the, the hall. And I went down and my house was full of red hat ladies who thought they were at the Burwell School. They thought they were at a house. And they just come in. Well, of course, because they thought it was on the house tour. And they were going paid their around ticket. and they they're, yeah, and they paid their ticket and walked up the hill. And there they were. So they said, well, can't you just show us around? We're already here. <laughs> now, how did this turn into, I, I, and there, it was there's fun. more. And the, I showed them around. But then I thought, okay, how would that turn into, because an interesting, even colorful event like that is not a story. It's got to mean something to somebody. It's a good backdrop. It's a good setting for the story, yes, but it's not the story. So I made up the main character as this academic wife whose husband has left her and she hasn't told anybody yet. And in come the red hat ladies and in showing them everything in the house, all the memories of her whole marriage come, rushing back. come back and she's making, you know, she's, right. she's at well, that right, turning Speaking point. of rushing, I'm rushing she's back. She's at the turning point. <laughs> the, uh, wonderful. That's just got to read that, got to read that story. We got to rush along, but at, at, as house tour in this wonderful setting, the story is, like a number of your stories, maybe many of them, in which a marriage or love affair is really strained, breaking up, broken up. Um, I mean, and is that happy is this the story? Happy families are all alike, <laughs> did you? But unhappy families are the ones that have the stories. <laughs> so it's not that you're you know? asserting that we're all like this. It is no. that these are the, the, the interesting things in life come from unhappy situations. Well, no, they come from. Point, they come from points where change is possible. And I'm not saying the interesting things in life, but I'm saying the things that become plots for stories is you know a character really well, and then you write the story about the day on which something different happens, a possibility for change occurs. And it could be from an unhappy mm -hmm. reason or just from, you know, another possibility. Well, but it's not the average day, it's the special day. Well, uh, another sort the of... The turning point unhappy situation that yeah. kind of resolved itself in a religious way is is, and you, is uh, Tongues of Fire. Yeah. Uh, quickly, is this Tongues of Fire autobiographical? Well, sure. It is. No, it is very much this the is kind, about of, a girl, girl who the kind of girl who I was growing up carefully raised, 
you know, by a, a daddy who ran a dime store and a mama who was a home economics teacher. But I was fascinated with the more dramatic life of one of my best friends whose mother spoke in tongues. And every time I went out there to spend the night, she'd speak in tongues and fall out and we'd get to catch her. And the little girl all in this. your and story. So that, again, <laughs> gave it, the little girl is not me, but that well, autobiographical. I just got to ask you this before we quit. But the, the little girl in the story heard God speak and she spoke in tongues. Yes. Now, did you hear God speak? I thought I did. You thought you, did you speak in tongues? No. <laughs> I got put in the infirmary. Now, did you, feel, <laughs> did you feel cheated because you couldn't speak in, because you didn't? Well, actually, I don't think I thought of it at the time. But I was very much drawn to this and very jealous because my friend was having these experiences that I was not. And so I was at camp, and I was kind of sick. I think I had bronchitis. It had been raining all summer, and I really thought that I was heard this voice, which again recurs in Mrs. Darcy right. at a much later point in someone's life. And so I'm just, I like the characters that are open to possibility. Like, they're going to, they're the ones that are going to find their way into my stories. And I did think I heard, you know, I definitely heard someone calling right. me and nobody would pay attention to me and they put me in the infirmary. <laughs> 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 so much provisions. <laughs> Lee Smith, thanks for sharing your stories and Thank your story you, with us today. This is Mrs. Darcy and the Blue-Eyed Stranger, new and selected stories by Lee Smith. It's a great book and even better to have this visit with her. Thanks to all of y'all for listening. Uh, I'll be right back here on North Carolina Book Watch at the same time. Funding for North Carolina Book Watch is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNCTV, and by the Mary Duke Biddle Foundation, Quail Ridge Books and Music, and the North Carolina Humanities Council. Podcasts on unctv.org are made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNC-TV.